The public inquiry begins into what's been described as the worst treatment scandal in NHS history. And victims from Oxfordshire of the contaminated blood scandal will be hoping for answers. Many haemophiliacs and patients needing blood transfusions in the 1970s and 80s were given medical products infected by donors, including people being treated at the Oxford Haemophilia Centre at the Churchill. Some developed HIV and Hep C and thousands died. Campaigners have argued there was a high-level cover-up with information withheld from patients. With some background, here's our health correspondent, Catherine Burns. It's impossible to know how many people were infected by transfusions during surgery or childbirth, and thousands of haemophiliacs received contaminated blood too. There weren't enough supplies in the UK, so some was imported from America, from paid donors and prison inmates. There was a privately funded review in 2009, but it had no official status. In 2015, families dismissed a Scottish inquiry as a whitewash. Now, after years of campaigning, this inquiry will be led by a judge and will be able to compel witnesses to give testimony. The key questions are, when did authorities know about the risks and did they act quickly enough on that information? Well, Neil Weller from Southmore has been a haemophiliac since he was three months old and was infected with hepatitis C in the 80s and, and still feels the effects, I would imagine, today. Good morning, Neil. Thank you for, for being there. Take me back to the very beginning. When did you first realise that you may have been given this infected blood? Good morning, David. How are you? You OK? Yes. Um, I was told when I was 19, maybe age 20, that I had what was called non-A, non-B, and they actually managed to conclude that it was a virus called hepatitis C. But the, this is one of the areas of concern, is that for, for years um, we were tested for viruses that we wouldn't even know we were being tested for. I, you know, suddenly found out that I was tested six times for HIV, and thank God I was negative, but, you know, so many of my friends unfortunately weren't. And we were never told, and this was uh, one of the one of the things that we hoped to come out and inquire is that the medical staff knew that we had these viruses, these bugs were going around, and they were testing for us, but we were never told that we were being tested for us. So it was always kept in the dark. What impact has this had on your life now? Well, <laughs> put it this way: when I was, like I said, I was I wasn't actually born at three months. I was sorry, I was born with haemophilia. I wasn't sort of given it at three months. And my parents were given a prognosis that the haemophiliacs that were born in the 70s didn't have much hope, really. There wasn't much much joy. That was just living with haemophilia. And, you know, I was to survive my teens, and, you know, that was, <laughs> that's the way things were going to go. But, you know, luckily, I got through it. You know, the, in one way, I suspect the treatments that came onto the scene as I went through the Aces and Nineties were, were amazing. You know, they really were advances. But unbeknown to us, there were so much bugs in them as well where they were actually um, importing them. And, you know, there was some inophilic sort of being treated like live lab rats, as it were. You know, it was just horrible now looking back. But at the time, you know, it's such a horrible, it's like a living hell having haemophilia. And to have this as well and wipe out virtually a generation of us haemophiliacs, it's just hard to comprehend. What do you hope now will come out of this, this public inquiry, which no doubt will last an awfully long time? We'll get a sense when we have the scale, I think, of what happened. But from, from your personal yeah. point of view, is there anything that can be said in the final outcome that will, uh, and I hesitate to use these words, but uh, put things right for you? Yeah, it's, it's, we've come 30 years, and we believe it's going to be another two to four years, this inquiry. And I get asked that question a lot. And I think it's like... To be honest, I thought about this coming over up to London last night, and I get a feeling there's whenever there's an accident, an incident, whether it's a train crash or whether you know where hundreds of people die, two thousand eight hundred of us were killed unnecessarily. This could have been prevented because someone made a decision, and I think all the the wives, the children, the parents. Even the people in the nursing industry, they, they lost their friends. I think all of us want answers and to something that could have been prevented. And as I say, with every major incident, like a train crash, plane crash, call it what you like, Grenfell, someone made a decision somewhere. Someone caused this, or a group of people caused this. And it's been a cover-up. Documents have been lost. 
someone's got to come to count. And that, this is what we're hoping, at least, you know, we, we can finally get out of all this. Thank you very much, Neil. Thank you for your time this morning. No uh, after eight, I'll speak. Thank you. After eight, uh, we'll talk to a mother whose son died when he was just 15 after contracting HIV from a treatment in Oxford. We've approached Oxford University Hospital's NHS Foundation Trust, but have received no response. Meanwhile, the government's told the BBC the infected blood inquiry is a priority for the government and that it's committed to provi- <coughs> excuse me, providing the inquiry with all the support it needs.